and welcome to BGU Annual uh, Review. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor and uh, pleasure to be with you. And as you all know, every year this session is about giving you a look of what happened in the university in the past year. But this year we've decided to do it a bit differently. Usually you hear the president of the university talk about this year's achievement. This year we want to talk about the woman behind the title. So please welcome President of BGU, Professor Rivka Kaumi. Good morning, Professor Kaumi. Good morning, Dana. It's such a pleasure to be with you. We want to begin at the beginning. So, to all of you who don't know or forgot, Professor Rivka Karmi, an expert pediatrician and researcher at the university with an international reputation in medical genetics, the dean of its health science faculty, with an impressive profile academic resume for someone leaving that and accepting a leadership role. And then when you said yes for the first term, you declared a declaration. I'm sure you all remember. Rivka Karmi said, I am not Herod. Huh. <laughs> yes, indeed I did. <laughs> and little did I, little did I know. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, it haunts me to this day. Um, yeah, you know, when you're there, you don't uh, see things over here and vice versa. And uh, I'll tell you, even those... Uh, and, and you know, I came from the academia. And coming from the academia is... Uh, you know, we're always complaining about, you know, university management building, building. But what about research? I mean, what's inside the building? So I was very determined to take care of what's inside the building. And, uh, and, and it was like twofold kind of, uh, of uh, decision of thinking. First, uh, to bring the younger, the brightest uh, um, researchers to, to the university, because, you know, without uh, talent, actually you cannot reach uh, excellence in research. And then it was about uh, promoting and upgrading the research facilities in the universities, which at that time were very decent. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you some examples for that. Um, I think I remember my first uh, project actually was the preclinical research uh, facility, which you have in every university that's doing uh, biomedical research. And uh, in fact, if, if not for that, we wouldn't be able to recruit the young scientists, you know, the ones that comes from all over the world having their postdoctorates in the uh, most prestigious institution. Um, another example is the uh, nanotechnology uh, drive. That, in fact, you know, we started because uh, it was a national drive for nanotechnology. Uh, it was an uh, announcement for all universities and we said, there is no point and there is no way we wouldn't, you know, be part Jump of this, right? But, right. but eventually, I think we managed to, uh, to build a, an extraordinary infrastructure uh, of um, um, microscope, you know, state-of-the-art microscope and, uh, and nano-optic uh, um, equipment that actually served the whole university all over, from biomedical sciences, life sciences, uh, and to engineering, definitely. And when I, if I think about the third example, is the fact that we decided to move uh, the National Institute for um, uh, Solar Energy from its old barracks. And, and I'm sure people here know uh, what was Actually, the that, that was the first story we did together. Absolute, remember on television. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, Went there and, to see and the I film. was naive enough to think, you know, that when you're going to display it, you know, in prime time, everybody would come, give the money. But then we decided to move them to a very, you know, a modern facility. By the way, at the time, we didn't have the money for that. So we said, but, you know, the way to really put us again, uh, you know, solar energy was our, one of our strengths in this university. So uh, I think by really giving those young scientists this wonderful of infrastructure, did it. And if you had to choose one of the many, what would you single out as a very special or extraordinary project that you did? Well, if I have to think about something that's really extraordinary in terms uh, both of university and in general speaking, I would 
think about the National Institute for Biotechnology in the Negev, which is a very, very unique enterprise. Uh, it is uh, a for-profit company within a university, which in itself is a very, very unique model. Uh, it is a three-part kind of a project where um, a very generous uh, donor, uh, Mr. Edgar de Picciotto, the late Edgar de Picciotto, uh, put $30 million as a uh, quote unquote investment. Actually, he didn't, he didn't accept to get anything out of it, but it was kind of investment because he strongly believed in the, uh, in, in the idea of, of this institute, uh, the government, 30 million and the university, part in kind, but uh, some, of the some of the money came out of pocket. And uh, it, it, was, uh, it is still to this day uh, uh, an outstanding partnership that, uh, first of all, promoted bio biomedical research in, in the university in general. But in particular, because uh, of the orientation of, of the research there, I mean, researchers are doing basic research, excellent basic research, because we manage really to bring very, very good scientists, young scientists over there. But they have this um, uh, uh, translational kind of orientation with the idea to eventually commercialize it. So commercialize for the world, for the benefit of the world, but also eventually, in years from now, for the benefit of the university budget as well. I think it's only natural that we would start talking or you would start pointing out uh, technology and science. But we are in a university and as we know there is this, um, I think, national and international trend where science and technology overcome humanities, humanities. And I know that you made a point in the university here in the Negev not to do that and give humanities its, its, its space. Well, absolutely true. You know, first of, I think first and foremost, we are a comprehensive university, and humanities is a very fundamental pillar in a, in a comprehensive university. Uh, and second, you know, personally, I think that without uh, uh, creative art, without uh, scholars, without intellectuals, uh, there is no university at all. Um, but in fact, I think we also managed to put ourselves uh, in the center of humanities in Israel. Um, again, if I give exam can I give examples? Is, uh, one is the, uh, uh, the Department of Arts in, in the Humanities uh, and the, uh, the Heksherim Institute that housed the most known Israeli writers, Amos Oz, Chaim Be'er, Shimon Adaf, Edgar Keret, um, uh, well, the late Aaron Appelfeld and David Avidan, and, all managed by Igor Schwarz, Professor Igor Schwarz, and really something that uh, is known in Israel and all over the world. Uh, the Goren Goldstein uh, a Department for Jewish Thought, which is uh, really one in a kind in Israel, uh, the leading in its field with young scholars and, and the brightest PhD students. Um, and now, now recently known all over the world with the, the new massive online open course, the MOOC in Kabbalah, which is being viewed by more than 2,000 two people all over the world, including Arab countries interested in Kabbalah. Um, and, and finally, you know, we have three Israeli Prize in the university. All of them are coming from humanities. Yaakov Blitzstein, Shmuel Achituv, and now Elisha Kimron this year. So it just goes to say that uh, humanities is something very central to this university. You can't do without humanities. So all this happened um, by the year 2010, meaning your first term, even before you ended the first term as president. And uh, I know that there is much more. I want to take you through these uh, numbers. So between 2006 and 2010, there were 200 new faculty bring home the minds. I think that's when we did the story. Uh, more students from 1,700,000 in 2006 to almost 20,000 in 2010. 2008, we all remember the global financial crisis, yet uh, BGU remains financially sound. And then in winter 2009, of course, Operation Cast Lead, uh, Ben Gurion University discovers its resilience Although the studies are interrupted and exams are canceled, students support the negative community and listen to this um, figure. BGU has highest percentage of combat troops among 
its people. So that was the first term. Um, and then comes the second term, which takes us from 2010 to 2015. And I know that you're a person that defined goals, that you work with goals, and you're very focused. So take us back to 2010. What are the goals that you see for that second term? Well, first of all, you know, going from the first to the second is a continuous process. I mean, things are in the works, and uh, you just go ahead as, uh, as uh, you know, as if there is no, you know, uh, uh, stop over there. But, but that was the point where we did, did some strategic decisions about teaming up with the governmental decision to move the IDF to the Negev. Uh, this historic decision about moving uh, first in training bases, but, late, but then uh, the elite high-tech um, uh, and intelligence unit to the Negev uh, provided the university with a, with a historic opportunity to actually take very active part in that and be partners to the IDF in implementing the, uh, uh, the plan, which is a very, very complex one. And secondly, to really strengthen uh, the field in the university that were already very strong to begin with, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, anticipated needs of, uh, of, of the IDF, of the moving uh, units. So uh, ICT at the time, that was really strong in the university, uh, following our, our relations with Deutsche Telekom, eventually became cyber. I'll, I have to, to remind us that uh, a decade ago, cyber wasn't even a term. Um, and then robotics, general robotics, but uh, especially autonomous vehicles, uh, artificial intelligence, and the whole man-machine interface, uh, uh, data mining, everything that goes around this kind of, uh, of technologies, um, and obviously, in, in parallel, uh, looking for, you know, the multinational uh, companies. Actually, they were looking at us uh, to see whether we are able to anticipate and, and foresee what will the future, the needs of the, uh, of the IDF, IDF. Now, working for this uh, morning, I came about three pictures I need you to help me understand them. Take a look at this. So here in the first two pictures, we see then Prime Minister Ehud Barak, look how young he looks without the beard, laying a, a cornerstone, that's 2000. Fast forward 2007, we see then Prime Minister Ehud Olmert laying the same cornerstone here in the university, and it doesn't end there. Fast forward to 2014, and here we see Prime Minister Netanyahu with you laying the exact same or cor same cornerstone. So is that a is that is that the you know is that something that you do? You keep that cornerstone so that you can you know entertain any prime minister that comes over. Well, first the the, the real fact is that he was launching the first building already, so it's not. It wasn't just a laying cornerstone, but, you know, it looks like as if they were waiting for me to come. But seriously, but seriously, uh, you know, I perceive my, my place as uh, fulfilling the vision. The vision was there for many, many years. And by the way, I, ha I have to go back. Uh, some of the people may know, but uh, we obviously know that the original idea for creating a high-tech park by the university was in order to uh, create high quality job in the Negev and to be attractive to graduates of their own universities to stay in the Negev. Because one of the major issues here were that we were very, very um, uh, like, you know, students like us, but then they would graduate and go to Tel Aviv. But you know, for years it was really, I mean, it was not realistic to think that people will come, multinational would come from Herzliya, from Tel Aviv to the Negev. What would they do here? But the tipping point was uh, the uh, decision of the government. So uh, I think uh, it was a time. It was a matter of timing. The time was ripe, and we had to make a decision. And the strategic decision was, as I said before. But then you were signing a decision that would take us 20 years ahead. Did, you, did your hand tremble when you took that decision? It did tremble. but. Uh, David Barakat's hand trembles as much as mine at, at that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But, but you know, we looked at each other. I don't know whether he remembers, but uh, I was in my office. We looked at each other and we asked each other, you know, do we believe in it? Do, really be, do we really believe that we can create a high-tech park, you know, across the street from the university? And we, and we said yes. Then it was clear this is what we had to do. And the next step, the next morning, I was, we were already knocking on doors of, you know, CEOs of international companies. Uh, it, it wasn't at all simple. Uh, you know, the first man that uh, came on board was uh, Dr. Orna Berry, and I don't know whether it has to do with women leadership or anything, but, you know, uh, Orna, as you know, is, uh, is one of Israel's uh, icon innovation, in, in innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and she believed in, 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 in the idea, and they said, yeah, we're coming. I mean, we didn't even, you know, it was a pile of, of, of dirt. And, they, and she said, no, we're going to, to stay here. I mean, they took uh, a building in Beersheba, and they said, we're going to wait for the park to build. But once she managed to, um, uh, to convince her CEO, you know, the EMC at the time, now it is Dell EMC, it was much easier for us to lure you know, other CEOs of other companies. So uh, it, it really made a huge difference. And then it's two bridges and... Oh, I, I mean, it is so obvious. You would have seen it around here. I know, it, it is so, now it is so obvious. It seems like, you know, it was there forever. Two bridges connecting the university and the campus, uh, three buildings. The fourth one is, is just um, about to be built. The fifth is in the planning process now. 2,500 employees, you know, only four years ago we had 200. Uh, it is amazing, you know, and, and I, I don't, you know, looking back, I'm not surprised at those that say it was insane. It was insane at the time, but now it's, it's a reality. So you know what, it, the result is actually a footer for a terrific action movie, so let's take a look. I guess you could say I'm a morning person. I wake up every day at 5 to catch the 6 a.m. train so I can open my lab early, and I love it. In 2013, I ran a very big technology unit at IBM's research lab in Haifa. It was a great job, but when IBM asked me to drop everything and open an innovation center in the Negev region, I didn't hesitate for a second. For me, it was more than just a career choice. It was a calling. In the beginning, I was the lab's first and only employee. Today, I have a team of tens of exceptional people, engineers, researchers, and academics, all working together in the only IBM lab in the world that focuses entirely on cybersecurity. In the future, most vehicles, private and public, will be connected to the IoT, the Internet of Things, making them viable targets for cyber attacks. Someone needs to defend our means of transportation to keep them safe. Yair, we have a situation here. I'm seeing signs of a ransomware attack on the train. Which train? The train I'm on. Seems to be related to those latest X-Force reports we've seen. I need you to check the traffic patterns, including the onboard Wi-Fi. Yep, checking. And send me any offenses you see. We're on it. There's a block. They're trying to crush our intrusion detection system. Get some extra virtual machines on the IBM cloud and run our new malware detection algorithm. It's a known hostile IP. They've come up with a new strand of ransomware. Try to shut down their CNC server. Okay, I'm on to them. Okay, great job, everyone. My name is Dr. Yaron Wolfstall, head of IBM's Cybersecurity Center of Excellence in Beersheba. And beside me, like-minded visionaries, leaders, and pioneers, each breaking new ground in their respective fields. All right here at the Gav Yam Negev Advanced Technologies Park in Beersheba. The place where we shape the future. Possible, possible. Right, absolutely. Well, I have, I have a very uh, cute story about your own, but, but let, me, let me say beforehand that uh, I should have mentioned the fact that actually uh, this uh, uh, high-tech park uh, is, is the cyber hub of the, uh, of, of the, uh, of the, city, of the state of Israel. 
uh, you know, is the center uh, nation, with the National Center for uh, Cyber Research, uh, which was uh, created by us, by BGU and, uh, and, and the, uh, uh, the government of Israel, and the National CERT, the Cyber Emergency Response Team that uh, actually reside in the second building. So this is definitely uh, one very robust uh, center of cyber, not only in Israel, I think in many regards in the world as well. I hope uh, the Iranian don't hear me. Uh, They're busy today. They're waiting yeah. for President Trump's announcement. <laughs> Um, uh, but, but the story about Yaron, you know, Yaron, um, uh, he, he built the, uh, the cyber research um, center for IBM. So when he came, that was about uh, five years ago, uh, this, the IBM C M CEO came to the university and actually said, we just uh, need some space here. Um, I mean, and I said, yeah, we mean to rent some space at that time. The space, the certain space we were, uh, we were considering was the one that was uh, um, uh, released by Deutsche Telekom that moved to the park, to the first building. And we said, no, 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 we are not a real estate company. You cannot uh, just lease a, a space in the university. And I have uh, Danny uh, Bloomberg, Vice President for Research and Development, sitting in cr across from me, can attest to my uh, testimony right now. And we said, you know, we have a condition, it's actually two conditions. One, that you have research projects with our staff and students and defined one, and, and we define it with numbers. And secondly, then in three years, you move to the park. That's it. So it took them some, some time to really realize that we are serious. And uh, now they are in the third building. They have three numbers, or at least triple the number of their employees. They have numerous research projects with the university, just uh, come to tell you that uh, this kind of strategy and, uh, and, uh, and approach works. That's, uh, that's amazing. I think that is a source of pride to all of us, not just here in the, in, in, in the university. But I want to summarize what we covered so far. So um, great minds coming to BGU, research, strength and, and then the government takes a step that depends upon the university's abilities um, but all this results in need for more staff more infrastructure and continued growth so by 2013 in the middle of your second term correct me if i'm wrong the, univer the university is engaged in over 100 million dollars of a building boom weren't you the one who said you weren't herod that sounds to me like the mother of all herods well, yes, indeed, you know, and, and again, I say, things you see from here, you don't think from there. So once you get... Professor Kami, you should be careful. That's a phrase they use when they go into politics. Yeah, well, this is <laughs> one thing I promise you I won't, <laughs> I won't comment on later on. But, um, but this is true. I mean, everyone that gets to a leadership position see things differently. And I tell you something, you know, even those, and to this day, I have those, uh, you know, faculty, especially young faculty, come back and say, what do we need all those buildings for? And when it comes to them, they say they know that they cannot do research or even teaching on the grass. So, uh, you know, it still haunts me, but at least uh, I know how to deal with it right now. <laughs> so I just want to rub it in a bit. So let, let's take a look at what we were talking about, the mother of all heralds. <laughs>
I think it uh, goes to all of you too, right? So it's not just, uh, of course, it's always about the team working together. But I think everyone here knows you pretty well, and they know you as Rivka, Professor Rivka Karmi, the president of, um, of the university. But I want to get personal for a moment. Is that okay? Because... Okay, you know you. Okay. She said okay, right? Very, because... No, no. <laughs> because your university uh, colleagues have done some research on you. And the result are a few things that we don't know about Rivka. And I'll state the facts and you feel free to provide the explanation. So the first fact, you begin each day with 45 minutes of exercise, 45 minutes punctual. Well, to be more exact. Now with the microphone though. To be more exact. <laughs> I'm not sure everybody wants to hear it. So to, to be more exact, about 30 minutes of exercise and about 15 minutes of meditation. Every single day? Every, almost every single day. And if I don't have the chance, then I just walk. But except for, you know, yesterday and, this to, and, and today, you know. Uh, but, um, yeah, this is what really keeps me going, you know. This, I, I need, like, an empty head to start my day. The only exam you've ever failed was, you're not going to believe this, in genetics. Wow. <laughs> Oh, this is so true. <laughs> it's very embarrassing because <laughs> it is the only single exam that I ever, ever failed in my life. Do you remember how much you got? No, but it was pretty low. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, I have excuses for that, you know, because I, I, you know, genetics was my thing since I was 14 years old. So really, I, I think I knew genetics more than my teacher. And you know, when you know too much, right, Shimon? When you know a lot, then sometimes you, you, you just fail in simple questions. But then, you know, second round, second take, I, I got an honor uh, grade. So, yeah. I <laughs> what, what year was that? There was uh, the well, second year of my medical school. So until the second year of your medical school, you've never failed an exam? No, never, And since ever. then, you've never failed an exam? No. Okay. <laughs> Now, this is interesting. You once almost missed a flight because of the Israeli uh, TV series Fauda. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was quite recently, you know. Yeah, I was sitting at the gate <laughs> waiting for, uh, uh, for the call. And I was so much immersed. I don't remember which episode, but it was really... I mean, and they're about to close the gate and then somebody approached me and said, are you for this flight? I said, yeah, of course. He said, we're closing the gate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fauda, you should all see it. It's a great show, but don't miss your flight. Um, <laughs> never an unread mail in your inbox. How is that possible not to have an unread mail in your inbox? <laughs> you know, because, I, you know, I dread this little one, the little circle that gives the number of... Uh, of, of unopened uh, emails, I dread it. Like it's something obsessive. I need to see it zero. So whenever a mail comes in, no matter what you're doing, you answer? Almost never. Here are my stuff, you can ask them. You can ask them. <laughs> do you t did you try her? I mean, do you, do you say, let's see if Rivka is going to respond and we send her a mail, see who gets it first? Two in the morning. Two in the morning? <laughs> Anytime, see? Now you have all my secrets in the open, <laughs> God. <laughs> okay, so your favorite leisure activity during your sabbatical was learning to play the cello. Yeah. Why are you not performing but the cello instead of talking today? But that's really rubbing it in, because, you know, I was... <laughs> <laughs> that's my most favorite instrument, by the way, and I always wanted to, uh, to learn playing a piano, and I did it on my last sabbatical. And I lasted about half a year into the year after, but then it was too much, it was too much. Do but you still have a cello? Uh, I don't have it anymore, no. But this is one thing I really regret. So maybe you'll get back to it. Who knows? No, <laughs> I don't think. My fingers doesn't, doesn't do the job anymore. <laughs> and this is, this is the last one. I think it's going to really interest all of us women in the crowd. You're the world record holder of light traveler. You never, ever, ever check in a suitcase. Right. <laughs>
Never. We want the secret. We want the recipe. And yeah, I have, I have a lot of testimonies over here. But where is Daphna? Where is the... Yeah. Am I... Is it right? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, with all those delays and, 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 uh, and, and, and short connections and, uh, and very short stays, you know, sometimes I'm, the, I'm in places for 24 hours or so. So you cannot really... Uh, you cannot, you cannot really lose luggage. You don't have the luxury of losing a luggage. And so it's always glued to me. Uh, it means that I cannot do too much shopping, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I manage something sometimes <laughs> with that as well. <laughs> okay, so now we see your normal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so we're talking about spirit. Let's talk about uh, the unique spirit of Ben Gurion University, because I think it is known about its uh, s special spirit. And you know what? Instead of talking, let's begin with the world premiere of a very special short film. Big organization, fresh startup. How do we make this work like this? With agility, with passion, with drive. It takes a kind of magic, a spark, a combination of, I don't know, spirit, inspiration. A strong desire to change the world, to make an impact. There are few places in the world where all of this really comes together. This is one of them, Ben Gurion University of the Negev. 6,500 people come here every day and act like three guys in a garage working on their startup. What's behind this? We're talking about some of the world's most talented young researchers, like David, and they choose to come here to be part of this phenomenon. I think each one finds their own calling. It could be academic excellence or close ties to the community. They must have something in common. They feel that they're making history at every moment. Academia and education have always thrusted humanity forward. And here we see this in action. This place is dynamic, it changes, it moves and evolves right before our eyes. Not too long ago, there was nothing but sand here. Today, there are thousands of talented people working for the world's leading high-tech companies here in Belsheva. They are here for a good reason, us. This high-tech park continues to grow at an insane rate. The university itself will double in size within the next decade. I mean, it's huge. We became a global cyber center. This story is exhilarating. It's contagious. 6,500 faculty and staff, 20,000 students, and everyone in the vibe of a garage startup. It's almost inconceivable. It's pure magic. And we've only just begun. You know, I was really surprised when I saw that video because it doesn't look like a, you know, a promotion video for your university. It's more like something you would expect from a startup company. Well, I think in a way we are a startup, not company, but a startup university. Uh, I think the whole, you know, project of BGU is a startup kind of uh, endeavor. Um, I think it goes back, I think, to the fact that uh, we're young. We don't take ourselves for granted. Uh, we strive for excellence, and uh, people are very much uh, eager uh, to prove themselves, to innovate, to, uh, and they're very entrepreneurial. Uh, I think it is uh, a startup, absolutely. But you know, you, you said you're young, but even you know, successful startups have the phase where they become a company. How do you maintain this atmosphere of a startup in a, in a university which is, 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 you know, is becoming of age? Of young age. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, well, when I think about it, I, I, I often think about how this university managed to keep the spirit, even though it is, by the way, budgeted like every other university in Israel. It is not being budgeted for its uh, unique uh, role in, 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 uh, in developing the Negev, for example, which is the, the original mandate of this university to spearhead the development of the whole region. So I think people are still connected and still attracted to the idea that we are more than just 
a research and teaching institution. We are here for something bigger. You can feel it among the students. I mean, I think I have the feeling that we also manage to attract very special kind of people that are very much involved, want to involve in the community. And uh, uh, I think one of the, uh, of the, what we call part of the spirit is the fact that uh, we care, we think that we have an, an obligation, we have some kind of um, responsibility on the community. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, you know, the idea of entrepreneurship and the fact that we, we want to give an added value to our students when they go out of the job market. And uh, so they are, I think they are much more prepared than, than other uh, students. So this is part of the whole spirit which uh, encompasses uh, also uh, faculty. And talking about social awareness, let's go back to 2011. Um, and that was, of course, the social pro protests here in Israel. How did they affect the university and the housing crisis? How did you manage to incorporate that into the vision of the university? So you know, it took us not a long time. It took us some time, you know, to really realize that we can capitalize on uh, on, on on this move. Uh, one of the of the major issues in the social protests at the time was uh, the lack of housing for students uh, all over Israel. So the government of Israel came out with subsidies uh, as well as uh, offered uh, state land in order to build uh, dormitories for students and. Uh, and it was, the same, it was at the same time when we anticipated the growth of the university and expansion in terms of students and faculty. And, uh, and we, uh, we, and we anticipated the lack of, of housing in Israel, you know, with everybody moving down uh, to the south. Um, so we seized the moment. And uh, we approached the government with uh, a plan to build a, a thousand uh, bed dorm dormitories, you know, based on uh, a very thorough review that we did uh, among among uh, students and future students. So really, I mean, tailor-made kind of very upgraded and uh, in modern um, dormitories. And uh, we managed to lease 58 acres of land, you know, just across from the railroad to the north, the same size of the current campus. Uh, and we said, you know, the first project is going to be the uh, dormitories and then uh, uh, obviously more buildings, more labs for students. For, <laughs> more We're going buildings, back to absolutely, more buildings. Absolutely, because, you know, if you, if you grow a number of students and we anticipate to, to grow by uh, around 1,500 students in about three years from now, it means faculty. And, you know, uh, you cannot recruit faculty, you know, at the very last moment. You have to prepare things from... Uh, so what I can say, I think it's, it is very important to, uh, um, to really state the fact that uh, we were the very, among the very few institutions that actually, you know, rose out of the plate and, 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 and actually uh, um, accepted the offer of the government, right, David? I mean, uh, maybe the, we are the second, only two institutions. And moreover, since this uh, North Campus is a huge, huge uh, financial un undertake, we are the first university in Israel uh, to have an approval from the government to take a bank loan. And it's based very much on the fact that uh, we, we presented a very sound kind of uh, program, but also being very sound financially for many, many years. So I think this is a wonderful testimony to the fact that this is one great university. And this brings us to your third term. And I want to ask you, if you look back, when you took on the position. How long were you thinking? Did you think about a f second term or, or did you even think about a third term? Honestly? I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if that, <laughs> yeah, I think that would be nice. I wasn't thinking about more than two uh, terms. You know, I never in my life, I stayed in one job more than five years at the maximum. That was when I was the dean of the medical school. Five years, one less than the, the term because, you know, I said five was enough and I went for a sabbatical. Uh, and eight years seemed to me like eternity. But, you know, after two terms, uh, I found myself, you know, we found ourselves, you know, juggling so many balls uh, with, uh, with many projects, you know, in, uh, in the works, but not only well on the track. 
you know, the ATP, the North Campus, and, and uh, you know, some very significant gifts uh, that were, we were negotiating, and, uh, um, and some, some big research projects that we started, you know, uh, the, the brain tech, uh, stem cells, and, and quantum recently, but also we started it some, some, year, some two years ago. So, so it was like obvious that I, I, I need to stay another term. And you, maybe you just like the job also. That's also an oppor possibility. Well, you know, I have to admit to it, it's sort of fun. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I think I'm entitled to a little fun, at, at, at least. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a very don it's a very difficult job. It's a very complex job. I'm, I'm saying it, you know, on camera for the next president, you know. You don't come to Bengal University uh, to spend last year of your, you know, uh, or retire to the university. It's a hard work. It's a very complex uh, um, uh, institution, not, not institution itself, but the whole neighborhood. And you, you need to be, and you, you need to understand that you come to preside over an institution which, again, it is not just a regular university. So let's, let's talk about uh, numbers now. And this, about the third term, let's see uh -huh. the numbers. Numbers is your part here. Oh, okay. Oh, numbers is my part. Numbers is Yossi's part, so Yossi, you're going to, uh, to help me if I, if I fail. Um, yeah, yeah, I think we, we decided to bring some numbers just to get an idea of what happened in the last decades. Um, and, and, and since, you know, I, I say that research was one very central thing to the university and uh, obviously something I was aspiring to. Um, if you look at the research models, the university, just, just for you to see, that we went up, I don't see the, uh, the very small number, but from somewhere from uh, 9.5 to 12.5, which means that we were doing a lot better and faster than the others because the model is, is, uh, is a closed kind of, a, it's a pie, you know? Uh, it's, it's a closed kind of, of, a, of a pool of money, and in order to be there, uh, you have to be much, much faster. And we were going very fast, and I'm not going to even to tell you that in between, uh, the model was changed twice and against us, you know. Uh, and, and, but, but nevertheless, I think we, we really uh, made a wonderful job in really growing it. And, and, and then, I think the next one is the PhD students. Again, as a, uh, as, as a proof of the fact that this is about research, because PhD students are doing the research, especially uh, in the uh, sciences and technologies. So you can see the, uh, uh, the number of students. And I think the next one is uh, comparing the number to what happened in Israel, because recently uh, the model brought down the value of PhD students because of the uh, national um, uh, decision to, to uh, decrease the number of, of PhD students. But still, you can see the trend uh, at BGU versus uh, Israel in general, and I don't remember which is the next one. Yeah, this is also international students. Um, uh, we grew very significantly international students, and, and in fact, in PhD and postdocs, again, it is all about research. It is all, uh, all about uh, promoting and empowering research. Yeah, I thought this is another indication of, uh, of, of how well we are known now in the world, you know, especially since we started with uh, our advanced technology park. See the number of visiting visitors, and this is a very, what can I say, modest figures, because we cannot really, some of them are groups, we cannot uh, count them by, one by one, but we are busy on a daily basis with visitors from all over the world, uh, from academic institutions, you know, from governments, uh, from industry, you name it. And I think this is the last yes. one I'm bragging about. So, uh, yeah, just, just to have, get an idea, you know, in, in, uh, in, in a little more than 10 years, you know, the operating budget increased 87%, which means the, uh, there is a lot of action activity in the university um, with, uh, I don't see what's down there. Uh, yeah, well, the increase in endowment fund, obviously, the, uh, the dramatic uh, increase is uh, due to the uh, 
Marcus family gift, but uh, also without it, we managed to grow the endowment fund uh, of the university. You mentioned the Marcus, uh, Marcus uh, gift. I think that is the largest contribution ever given to an Israeli university and I think also to an Israeli institute. Absolutely. Well, you know, if I have to I have to phrase, you know, what happened to the university. I would say this is a game changer in, 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 the, uh, in the university history. And it is a remarkable story. It's really an outstanding story about an outstanding couple that I knew for more than a decade. Uh, uh, Lottie and Howard, you see the wonderful pictures. Uh, you don't meet people like that in the world, really. I mean, to Holocaust survivors that made their fortune, you know, in their own two hands and uh, very modest people. Um, and, you know, they, they could have, they could have given to anybody. You know, 85% of Jewish giving in the U.S. is to non-Jewish causes, non-Jewish causes. Both here, and, and only 15 percent is giving to Jewish causes, both in Israel and here. And here comes a couple who believe in us, who believe in the Negev, and Howard was very much into water. He, he thought that water was, is a very major commodity. Uh, he was really a, an incredible person. Um, and, and, you know, and gave it to one young, small institute, somewhere, you know, amazing. And, and you know, in a way, we have a commitment. We have a huge commitment to really keep the legacy of, uh, of this wonderful couple. And uh, where, is, where is Ellen? Here is Ellen. And Ellen is, uh, is Lottie and Howard's uh, daughter. And, and without her, I have to be very frank, without her, it wouldn't have happened. So uh, as I say, this is a life changing, a game changing for the university. And it's not, not only in terms of the money that we get, you know, from the endowment, but the fact that we can plan far ahead. It's really incredible. It's a story in itself. Yeah. You know, I think Israel is all about, Israel and Zionism and to, ex to an extent Judaism is all about stories and um, I think uh, this year is a special year for all of us because we commemorate the 70th Independence Day of the State of Israel and it, it you know growing up here it's not a given but it's uh, and it's a miracle we have to celebrate that miracle every day so I'm really interested to hear your perspective on this special date what do you think uh, what is the most significant achievement in the past seven decades and what do you see in the future for Israel? What would you want to see for Israel's future? Well, it's a good question. What I want to see, not what I see, because nobody can see. <laughs> um, well, to me, you said it in one word, it's a miracle. You know, uh, to me, the, the, uh, the, the, the startup nation uh, term, I, I cannot do it in a different way. Um, in spite of, uh, of all the unbelievable threats that we have around. I mean, from day one, from minus day one, to this day. And this enormous, unbelievable achievements of Israel is something which uh, I'm at always, always, even though I was, I was born here, and you tend to take for granted things that happen here. For the future, you know, I would think, first of all, uh, bridging gaps in the uh, Israeli uh, uh, society, because this is something very, very serious here, uh, more united, more equal community. I would like uh, Israel to be very attractive, to be attractive to Israeli, to stay here, for Israeli to come back, and also attractive for the, uh, for the uh, um, diaspora jury that, you know, should feel like Israel is a home away from home. I mean, they all have some kind of homelands, but to feel that Israel is their place. And, of course, peace, you know, but this is not up to me, and who knows up to whom <laughs> this is it. Yeah. So speaking about Zionism, and we are in the Negev, um, 
And it wasn't a natural spot on your CV. You were born in Zichron Yaakov, which is up north. And then you studied it in Jerusalem in the Hebrew U. And then you went to Harvard. Um, and then I think early as 1975, you come here to the south, to the Be'er Sheva. And I think, you know, I don't want to be, don't catch me by the word, but I think there were at least the same amount of camels as people around. Um, was it? a career decision to come to the Negev, or was it something deeper for you? It was, uh, I would say, a mixture. First of all, um, you know, for me, it was, I'm a kind of Zionist, and not a shame of. Um, and, and for me, it was about, you know, making a difference. Uh, I could have stayed in Jerusalem, you know, stay in Tel Aviv, and uh, or moved to Tel Aviv. Um, you know, the Negev really attracted me because I wanted to make a difference in health services. At the time, I came here for my residency. Um, and you were working I was with the Bedouins. I, I was very much attracted to the university, young university, and the medical school, which had a very, very, unique, still to this day, a very unique uh, curriculum, you know, the patient center rather than the disease, which was, to me, very new as a graduate of, of Hadassah Medical School. Uh, and the Bedouins, obviously, as a geneticist, I, I, was, I was really intrigued by the, the many genetic diseases among the Bedouins uh, due to intramarriage. And uh, yes, all of these really attracted me. I had no second thoughts ever. Ever? Because you have been here for um, 42 years. You had other options. You could have stayed in Harvard. Never, ever a second thought? What if? Again, honestly? <laughs> ever, ever, never. Although I, I tell you, every now and then I'm, I'm playing in my mind this revolving door kind of uh, of play. What if? What if I would have stayed, you know, in Jerusalem or moved, moved to Tel Aviv? Why? Uh, w w what if I would have set, accepted, you know, uh, the offer to stay in, in Children's Hospital in Boston? And, and one big question is. What if I wouldn't have accepted, you know, the offer to preside over this university? Which is another question, but, you know, that's a very kind of a, of a fun game, nothing more than that. I think you made the right choices, right? <laughs> we thank you for those choices. I, we, I, we, I want to wrap up, but I would, I would really, um, I would miss something very important out, which is for me personally something that I think uh, I learned from you throughout uh, my years in following what you're doing in the media. Um, and that is the way that you took on the feminist issue. Because there are a lot of women that, you know, make, make it, break the glass ceiling, and then forget what happened on the way. And don't want to talk about those feminist issues. They don't want, you know, even a lot of female politicians have done that. And no, you, on the contrary, whenever you speak, you always remember that first and foremost, you're a female researcher and a female leader. And um, I want to start by showing a short segment from a TED talk that you gave recently here in the Senate building. At the end of my biology uh, studies at the university, the first year, I decided to switch into medicine. My mother was at all not happy. She maintained that medicine is a very tough profession on a woman raising a family, and that biology teacher gets a vacation that really caters to the needs of mothers. Hearing her, I knew that I have made the right decision. Still, how many young women make their career choices based on society's expectations that are based on the precedents that they have to cater to their quote-unquote natural role as wives and mothers. I didn't realize that I was a feminist. In fact, at the time, I even didn't know what feminism was all about. Well, Dana, this is a topic I could, I could talk about for hours. Um, I, I was always very much... Uh, uh, involved, very, very much aware of, uh, of the fact that women has a lot of obstacles on their way, uh, juggling and balancing careers, especially in medicine. Usually you have to balance, you know, career and, and family. In medicine, if you want, in academic medicine, you have to juggle three careers, you know, cl clinical work, uh, 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 the academia, research, and, and family. And um, 
you know, to me, it is about uh, gender equality, obviously. And gender equality is uh, about social justice, but it is much more for me. It is about, you know, um, making every organization much better performing, you know, if, the, if, if there is uh, a gender equality. And, and there is something that the industry has already realized, you know, the, uh, the, there is a study done by uh, Fortune 500 uh, community that showed the, that the more you have, the, the higher percentage of women you have in the, uh, in the higher managerial uh, position, the better or the higher is prof profitability. So they can show it in numbers, actually, that you are more profitable when you have uh, more or less equal number of, of women over there. And, and I'm, I'm challenging you know, other organizations to create their own profitability index. It shouldn't be always in numbers, but, but every organization can really make uh, a point what is profitable for them. And then, you know, I think it's, it's the role of women when they get, when they've made it, to pave the way for, for the women colleagues. And you know, when I came to those positions, when my voice could have heard, you know, like being university president, being uh, the president of university presidents in general, um, the Council of Higher Education heard me, the Israel Medical Association heard me, and we have now two, I would say, very significant program in Israel promoting women in academia and in medicine. And uh, it is not that I'm only proud about it. I mean, I think it's something very significant for uh, years to come. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And you know, I just came back from the States and I went to one, a gallery with an exhibition, which was amazing. Um, and they came up with the statistics, statistics saying that there are more CEOs who are white and answer to the name of John in the United States than there are women CEOs. So we still have a long way to surprised. go. Yes, we still have a long way to go. Um, and I just want to say that uh, right after our conversation, uh, Professor Ada Yonat will be here to launch the first exhibition of its kind, saluting the women who have been awarded the Nobel Prize. So. And Ada, can I? Ada, Ada is, a, I think, is our best example of. Uh, of uh, of uh, this issue. Oh, okay. you wanted to say something? Do I have to say something? No, no, no. <laughs> you're going to have to, you're going to speak later. So, so I know Rifta more or less from the time she became a dean, I think, the dean of biology. Then I met her once in, in Beersheba. And I know Dana. Dana is the granddaughter of my kindergarten teacher. <laughs> And the kindergarten teacher is the reason I went to a normal school. This was in Measharim, in Jerusalem. If she wouldn't push my parents, I would go to a girl's school. And Rivka can tell you what would happen with me. <laughs> So it's all about women paving opportunities for other women. And if I Absolutely. could add just one sentence, raising girls to be their own boss is something to start with. But um, uh, we could go on. But I think uh, this is a good, a good point to, to say thank you for this inspiring conversation. And I'm sure that I speak on behalf of everyone here in the audience. And thank you for the contribution to this wonderful institute and for the time and effort and leadership that you put here and also projected to the, to the nation and to women around Israel. And um, for your help making the impact and making BGU what it is today. So thank you, Rivka Karmi, and thank you for this conversation. Thank you very much, Dana, but <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, but you know, it is never, never a one person kind of a job. Uh, you cannot do anything on your own. I mean, you can have a vision. But you have, when you have to implement a vision, you need to have partners. And I had the best, best partners I could dream of. First of all, in the university. I mean, students, faculty, uh, 
academic faculty, technical, managerial, but, but more than anything, my very close partners, uh, the very, the very, uh, what is the very close is the Namer, you know, the tiger is, Nassim and Karl Rector, and they're sitting here, and you know, I, have en I don't have enough words to really thank them. It's, and I'm, I'm talking about the, uh, the wider group of people around me. Uh, I think I was blessed and was really privileged. And I know other places in the world and in Israel. And this team of people at Emgurian University, I mean, they are the best. And uh, I think they can just take this university from now. Uh, I can't even imagine where it can get. Uh, but what can I do? My friends, what can I say? I mean, if not for you, you, my friends, my supporters, the ones that believe in, at BGU, in the Negev, in me personally, I say without my intimate group, without you, you wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to do a fraction of what was displayed over here. So, you know, I'm so grateful. I'm so honored and privileged. You are real visionaries because you believed in a, you believed in a, what can I say, in a, in a small university, in a godforsaken place in the Negev, and you saw the light somewhere. You saw the potential. So I'm really grateful. Thank you so much, all of you, for your partnership, for your belief. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Rivka Karmi, thank you so much. Yeah.